You know, a couple of uh, weeks back, there was news that broke from uh, international news that broke in the country, right? That there was a team of an all-black team that was the first to summit Mount Everest, the highest point in the world. And in that team, among the many blacks, was one black from Kenya. And this man was not actually those young Barbaro chaps. He is a former teacher and is 62 years old. <laughs> and people were like, wow. Uh, and it, it was just an amazing story of, of seeing the photos, seeing the stories, and those things that make you feel proud. The man himself is here with us in the studio. He's James Kagambi popularly known as KG. Good morning and welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation, KG. Morning to you. Asante Sana for joining us. First of all, congratulations for, you know, hitting this milestone. Thank first you. Kenyan to climb Mount Everest and hit the peak. First uh, among the All Blacks to in the team to do this. Uh, very many things. Reading your stories, we realize that, yes, you worked as a teacher, but at the same time, you started climbing mountains at the tender age of 23. Just give us your story. So, this is KG. He's in his 20s. He says, ain't no mountain high enough. <laughs> people, other people are playing football. Yes. You've decided you want to climb mountains. Yes. Why? <laughs> uh, I was a scout, and uh, I like going out in the field. And whenever I want to visit a hill or something, I, you know, I got some interest. I wanted to know what is past there. Mm -hmm. And I remember my first expedition. I was in St. Joseph's um, High School in Kitale, mm. and I convinced the teacher to allow us to go to Mount Elgon. I had no clue what it is about, but I was convincing enough that I got 60 young of us, and I took them to Mount Elgon. We went half and came back. We spent a night. We had a lot of fun. And from then on, I knew I want to How start exploring mountains. I think that time I was 18. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, I'm sure before this particular point, when you're telling the teacher, let's let's go to Mount Elgon, mm -hmm. uh, it's because you can basically, you're in Kitale, Mount Elgon is not far, you've, had you climbed some hills here and there? Yes, in, uh, the in Karatina growing up, in mm -hmm. Laikipia growing up, just small hills. Um, but I have to say, in 1973, when... Um, they did the fireworks on Mount Kenya to celebrate 10 years. Mm. My dad got me out of bed and showed me, and I saw the fireworks. And I remember saying, I want to do that. <laughs> and I am the one who did it at the 50th anniversary. Oh. So, yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? My friend, it makes the heart glad mm -hmm. and makes the week move faster. <laughs> yes, <laughs> finally, this Friday is coming. It's coming. Yes, because this is delightful news. Mm. Yes, very heartwarming. At that age, when you're in fourth form, and um, this is a young man who grew up in Karatina, in uh, close to Mount Kenya, and now you are in Kitale, you have climbed um, th that mountain and come Mount back. Elgon. Mount Elgon. and you've come back to school. So, what happened next? Uh, I, well, I realized that whenever I went out to extracurriculum activities, everybody trusted me, thought that I knew what I was doing. <laughs> I had a lot of confidence. I could convince people to do just anything we would do it. Mm -hmm. I was always mischievous. I was always, even in Karatina growing up, during the season when it was very cold, I would be the one leading all the boys to make the fun things, the slides, and I would do it in every style. Mm -hmm. So... This is something that was in me, just doing things that other people don't do. How do you? How did you feel? Let's say the first time you convince your teacher, let us go climb Mount Elgon, and then you were able to convince all these other students to do it as well. Mm -hmm. When you completed that, or when you completed before you even get to this huge thing that you did just yeah. a, a couple of weeks ago, um, how did you feel every time you did something like this, and then you were able to accomplish it? I felt good but one thing i never forgot to do is as soon as i did something like that i would look back mm. and see what we went through and what could have gone wrong 
And then the next time I do it, I make sure that I cover all those loopholes. Mm. Yeah. And did you find that every time you did this first thing, the next thing that you wanted to do was more difficult? Did you want to do the more difficult thing? Did you want to conquer something greater after the first one that you did? Yeah, there's something in you. Like um, I'm a bit different with most other mountaineers who want to jump from one mountain to the other just because of the difficult. I find difficulties even within the same mountain. When I started rock climbing, I was practicing on almost one area in Hell's Gate, mm. and I was alone, and so I would do the same route, but differently, and then say, okay, now I'm doing the same route, but I want to feel a, 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 a difficult on this end, mm. I want to try this, so I can do the same thing over and over, but every time I do it, it's different. So I can, I've gone to Mount Kenya over 200 times, and every time I go, I still have fun. So... Yes, I would like to do different mountains, but I'm not that type of a mountaineer who just wants to do new mountains all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You said 200 times? Oh, over 200, yes. Uh, yeah. You're, do, you're not doing so badly, City. Kilimanjaro, 100. Over 100. See, yeah. City has done twice. Mount, thrice. Thrice. Yeah, that's good. Mount Kenya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But good. how is it that when you get older, it seems to get easier? That's my experience. It's not as difficult as the first time you try to climb. I, I think one uh, older people take to be mentally prepared. They have they, they are determined. Mm. They know to listen to whoever is taking them. Or younger people, I have that. Mm. Mm. Younger people, they really listen. You tell them. You can even sit down, teach them. Mm -hmm. But it takes long for them to understand. And when you have issues on the mountains, it's not the older people. Mm. It's the younger people who are just running. Um, and I try to compose them and yeah. tell them, okay, look, you are hiking behind me. Or, okay, you can run, but you fight me on top. <laughs> yes. Which happens yeah. a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. They start running and then they find you there. Yes. First time going up Mount Kenya, I'm assuming that after Mount Elgon, the next highest peak that you did was mm -hmm. Mount Kenya. Yes, it was. Okay, first of all, this time when you went the first time in, at Mount Elgon, you just went halfway. Yes. Did you go back? No, I didn't. And I haven't gone back. I have always planned to go back, mm. but uh, some things keep coming up. And then I will have an opportunity to, do, to do, go to, do to another else. mountain now, <laughs> a higher mountain. And so I haven't. So Mount there. Kenya, yeah. at the age of 23, mm. um, what inspired that? I was working at this time as a teacher next to Mount Kenya. And the first time I actually went or tried is again i convinced the teachers i was teaching with <laughs> over a weekend to go through the forest not even go the legal way and i borrowed some makeshift tents mm -hmm. and we went up and spent two nights in the forest we never made it D did you go through the or did you go through Meru? where did you no no just from the school from i went school. straight up forest, through up. The forest. <laughs> yeah I, 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 here, I'm, mountain is here yes <laughs> I, i'm a fan of that that's mm -hmm. what i do actually a lot in most mountains i just Take, say I'm going through here, and I and I and I go. Mm. Uh, but this time we didn't go far. Mm. But they had fun, and I couldn't understand because they were not used to it. Mm. That was the first time we never even went far. Then I got a chance now to do the real thing, and I went up, and I wasn't prepared. Wearing jeans, cotton T-shirts. By the time I got to Makinda's, headache, you know, very cold. Swearing, I'll never be there. I'll go back again. My friend said he cannot go past there, but I said I'm going to the summit. When I touched snow towards the summit, mm. something changed, and on my way down, I knew this is where I belong. Mm. And up to now, whenever I'm, I get on snow, my not life changes, but I change my character. Mm. It's not who I am down here. I just become uh, somebody. Very fun. <laughs> That's interesting because yeah. I was going to ask you what this experience does for your mind. Because every time we hear about mountain climbing, somebody wants to climb the mountain. Oh. It's about the physical preparation that you have to go through. You know, you must train for a certain number of weeks, eat certain kinds of foods, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But what does it do for your mind every time you experience the climb? 
I I don't know. When I leave and go to the mountains, I again I say I'm a different person. I'm able to entertain myself. That's when I can dance. I can do anything. You know, like on Everest, I made a lot of small groups of. Some people thought that I was getting crazy, by mm. the way. But you know, for those people who know me in the mountains, that's how I am. You um, come alive. Yeah, yeah. It's there's something that comes out of there that if you tell. Let's say if you tell some people in my family that I'm that, you will say, no, 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 that guy is, doesn't even Cage talk. He doesn't dance. Yeah, he doesn't do this. <laughs> but yeah, those people who have gone with me out, you know, in the back country, they know that I do that. Mm. Um, every time I go up, it changes me. I have a goal of making sure that either I'm challenging myself in a certain way, but I do it so much that I actually don't have to restrict myself to exercises to get ready to a mountain mm -hmm. uh, because that's my life. That's uh, how I earn my living. Mm. So I'm always in the background. You're always ready. Yes. As a teacher, and uh, obviously through your teacher training, you know how to inculcate uh, messages and character into people. Mm -hmm. When you now become a mentor for people who are seeking to climb a mountain yes what is the most important thing that you tell them what is the biggest lesson that you want to impart to them before you start taking them up the mountain safety is key mm -hmm. and listening to your leader as you learn and and also as you pick up uh, some things some lessons you learn don't move too fast thinking that, oh, now I'm an expert because you only need to get to that point where you're feeling comfortable and that's when you get in, in dangerous situations because right. you know something, but you don't know enough to know you don't know. Mm -hmm. And when you, by the time you know you don't know, <laughs> it's then that's when you start seeking for more information. Mm -hmm. So I tell people to be very careful with that. If it is serious mountaineering, I would like you to go hike as slowly as possible. Drinking water is very, very important because your body needs the water. And the going slow allows you to, to inhale uh, the amount of oxygen that your muscles need yeah. to move on. And if you do that, it doesn't matter what age, it doesn't know whether you, you have any disease, I can take you in any mountain. Huh. Yes. Walk us through the climbing experience on a, a mountain that would take days and how you start and going through night one and then going to the next night and like that. Uh, so when a, a question like that can be answered with there are different mountains and you approach them differently. Mm -hmm. First of all, you identify which mountain am I going to? Am I going to Kilimanjaro? Am I going to Mount Kenya? Am I going to Ruanzori? Am, am I going to Denali? Am I going to Aconcagua? And what does it entail? How long does it take? How high it is? And then when you come with all those answers, then you, you plan. Okay, the, the mountains that I have gone over a number of days, you know, Denali I did in 36 days, 1989. Because we started from the scratch and we had to plan and you don't have borders nobody is carrying your stuff yeah. so you take advantage of your body and your energy oh. to carry everything mm. so you have to bring the food and gear for all those days you're talking about gear you're talking about shoes just your shoe work mm. is like seven you know you have crampons you have bunny boots you have the real boots you have the rock boots you have the snowshoes, all those things. So and those you need, shoes you need are so all heavy. of them in this expedition. Yes, you use them as you go in different places. When you come to ice, when you come to rocks, when you come to, you know, as you go high, mm -hmm. and just those alone are very heavy. So then look at food, look at the tent and all that. So what you do is you start fairing. We call it fairing. So you start day one. You carry a load maybe up to two stages and then come back down sleep the following day take another load there come back and sleep and the third day or depending on how much load you have then you move the whole camp and you can say now we are in camp two mm. and then to come three you do the same to come four you do the same like that but as you go you're using food so you have less times of mm -hmm. of fairing but it may sound redundant, it may sound like, oh, this is too much work. Uh, forgetting that if, if you are not alone, you are with people. So every day you are going, you are learning about one another. Two, it's a high mountain. And what you need is your body to acclimatize, to be used to be there. And if you just go, if you start and go to camp one, camp three, camp four, 
you are said so quickly that your body cannot cool. deal with it. Mm -hmm. So most likely you are dying or just collapse. You, you can't make it. Mm. So it is a way of carrying your stuff, but also for your body to acclimatize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Would you then say that those who uh, go through the experience and have porters carrying things for them have an easier time, or would you say that they learn less or they get uh, a lesser experience? They still have full experience depending on who they are and how they come. Uh, I would wish that they would go without, but asking that, it's saying it's limiting because there are people who cannot definitely carry their own things. So if you say that you have to take a porter, then you are limiting other people who cannot do that. You're telling them you cannot go to the mountain. Mm. So we still encourage them. But there are ways of incorporating them into this porterage so the porter can carry a lot of things, but the person can still carry a little bit. You learn more when you do things for yourselves. But you still learn something, even if somebody is carrying things for you and they are cooking for you. And for grown-ups, a lot of them, you know how to cook. Uh, mostly when I'm teaching mountaineer, I'm, I'm teaching young, younger people who don't even know how to cook. You're showing them how to light a stove, how to set up a tent, and you, you spend a whole month with them. And at the end, you want them to know how to do those things. That person can come and take you to a mountain and bring you back. Mm. So you're teaching them so much things. But for grown-ups, they know how to do those things. It's their time to enjoy the mountain and just the, the, the good food that you know, the, the, the cooks will cook for them. I've always been intrigued by the story of porters. I mean, these people, they are going up and down a mountain mm -hmm. constantly, carrying heavy luggage. Yes. Wh what is it about them? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've interacted with very many of them. What's their story? I've been a porter. You've been a porter yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's the story? What inspires one to decide, okay, I'm going to be doing this? Is it just looking for a job and opportunities mm -hmm. or is it in addition to just loving i would say portage is mainly a, a job opportunity because mm -hmm. any porter who is good would desire to be a guide mm -hmm. or to be a cook because then you get paid more mm -hmm. um uh, in those days when i started a lot of people who were porters were people who could not communicate as easily to the clients and then there are others who can still communicate but they are doing their job as a porter so well mm. that they become head porters and we depend on them we say okay i have this load that needs to be taken by 20 people you are in charge i want this load in a certain place um porters work very hard mm. uh, but fortunately for them especially like f for most um, mountains they will carry the load to the base camp and then when they get there they just sit around they can help the cook but the person who actually does a lot of work is the guide because the guide cannot move at his own sp or her own speed mm. you know a porter can do that they can run up the mountain porter and will leave you yes and take your luggage a guide cannot you have to hike with your client and then when you get to camp the base camp the job of a porter is almost done <laughs> but the guide still has another wake up early in the morning and go summit and come back down mm. so that is the main difference you look at the guide is not carrying but is shouldering a lot of work mm. the guide is also in charge of the porters the guide is in charge of the clients the guide is in charge of the whole expedition and it's their job to monitor everybody and make sure that they are doing well mm. if one porter is not doing good it's you to decide i'm going to take them down or i'll get another one you know, make those decisions. You are a leader. Mm. Yeah. Did you ever start a climb and not finish? Did you ever start a climb and say, well, this one we cannot do. Let's go back and regroup and start again. Apart from Mount Elgon. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes, I have. And I'm, I'm, I'm always ready for that. I'm a mountaineer and I know that, one, I need to respect the environment. I need to respect the mountains and whatever. The mountain tells me to do this is what I'll do. I'm talking about the terrain. Maybe it's a mountain I've never been to. I'm talking about the weather. You can start with very good weather and all of a sudden, boom, it stops and you don't know where you're going. Mm. Maybe you may have your GPSs, you may have your, your maps, but uh, the weather that comes in does not allow you time to come all the way back down. And you have to make that decision that, okay, we are not summiting. When we go to the summit, there are times we will say, depending on the mountain, 
if we are not on top by this time we have to be back and there's a reasons why people leave very early to go to the summit if you want to ask that question i can answer later mm -hmm. um i would say that the most hurting mountain that i went up and i did not summit had summited it before denari which is 20,320 feet the highest in north america it's in alaska it's the coldest mountain actually uh, when i went to Everest, I felt like well, it's no cold. <laughs> uh, that mountain is cold. So in 2013, which was, I would say, was my the, the year I did a lot in mountaineering and got recognized so much. Mm. My middle recognition was being invited from Kenya to go to America and lead the first African American black expedition to the Nali which had climbed in 1989 as the first black African. And that was a big honor. Mm -hmm. And I went up there. It was, uh, uh, we were making a, a few more needs, you know, all these things. I had to, you know, make the team go up. We were four leaders mm -hmm. and the team members who are nine of them, and actually some of them were actually on, on Everest. And we did everything possible went up to 14,000, stayed there because the weather was bad for about a week. And then we had an opening, we went up to 17,000, slept two days. And then the third day we started for the summit. And I was leading on this last day, we were a hundred feet from the summit. Mm. And all of a sudden, it, everything was that blue clean. Mm -hmm. Like you could see the you summit. See. I was making fun saying I could see Everest. And all of a sudden, within like two minutes, the weather turned around. It was misty. There was this thunder starting to come down. Wow. And thunder is very dangerous up a mountain. Cause, and you can tell, you're holding an ice axe, you can see it. Just You can hear the sound wow. of electricity. What? You can, yeah, you can feel your hair. And that's, that can take a lot of people. Because you're closer to the thunder. Just <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I just said, turn around let's go let's run and you're tied down so you cannot run faster than the you person do you even run with down a mountain uh, you can't because you're on snow you can i mean wow. you're used to it but and you're tied to each other yes so we were able to get out 100 feet to the top and tell you what most of the other groups did not turn around they just continued comfortably mm. they went to the top they were safe they did not get hit by the thunder but um my what i know is that when that comes you don't wait you make a decision if it does, right there. you make a decision because if one of you gets hit because you're already tied between me and the next you're person tied to could, each other yes. yes and the other person could be like 20 feet mm. and usually when um, thunder strikes if i get electric electrocuted or yes, whatever um Anybody within 50 feet can also get it. What? So you're talking about your whole rope team. Entire, so pfft. I made that decision mm -hmm. and I did not feel about it and uh, bad about it. Mm -hmm. And when we went down, I still felt that we had accomplished the reason why we had gone up. What there. did your team feel? They felt they good. The there rest, are some people who are. The rest had actually made it. Yes. Uh, the rest had they had to continue and finish yep. and you had ordered your team to come back down yes are there some who looked at you and said they did not look at me because they would have made the same uh, decision. They, the same decision only that it's not the one, ones the ones who made it mm. so obviously you can say oh yeah he made it and <laughs> but everybody was very supportive and we agreed that was the best thing to do because you don't want to ask yourself if it yeah. touched the ground what would have happened yeah. i would not have i would rather be home rather than think about that i can leave the mountain is still there we can go back, can go right. back another some day. people are not very impressed because they really wanted to summit and we have been this climb was quite sponsored and it cost a lot of money and some people are like no coming back here i don't know when i can but we, i had to accept that but the bottom line is we accomplished our goal, goal number one, coming back alive. That's mm -hmm. the biggest success of our, an expedition. Mm -hmm. And I was happy about it. Goal number two, our main goal was to actually start to sensitize 
the black community in America to start going out in the outdoors. Mm. And already we had gotten so much publicity and it was out there. And even after the climb, you know, they all traveled around USA talking to groups of black people and also other uh, different genders, different colors, not only black. Mm. So you tick the boxes in terms of the objectives. Yes. Let's take a break. It's 27 minutes to 8. Kenya's biggest conversation this morning is hosting James Kagambi, KG. He is the first Kenyan to summit Mount Everest. And he was also in the team of the first all-black expedition to summit Mount Everest. He has climbed very many mountains in his 62 years on this earth. He has done Mount Kenya more than 200 times. He has done Kilimanjaro. He's done uh, this one that he's just telling us about Denali in Alaska. He's done many others. You'll tell us more about them and what else you've done. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. And our guest this morning is James Kagambi, KG, 62-year-old young man who recently climbed <laughs> Mount Everest. They're just going up there and coming down, one of the very many other mountains that he has climbed. And he's telling us about the experience of going around the world and just conquering summits. You've talked about how... Um, you have to be mentally prepared and psyched for this. In terms of physically, how much preparation is required to go up there physically? And then people talk about financial. How expensive is it to go up a mountain? Yep. Um, physically, again, you have to look at, you come up with a goal. Mm. I want to go to this mountain. Let's say you're in East Africa. I want to go to Mount Kenya, Lwenzori, or... Mm -hmm. So, how physically fit should I be? Mm -hmm. For Mount Kenya, I would say that you could use oak and Kilimanjaro. You, you, you may just be hiking as, as fine. It will take you there as far as you go slowly. For Renzori, it's almost the same, but you want to do it more rigorously because it takes a long time to come down. Um, and if you want to do Renzori in style, you can do the technical bit of it. Mm. And so, you need to know how to use ropes. If you want to get to the top of Mount Kenya, you need to know how to use ropes. Mm. But for beginners, I would say that just hiking in the morning for a kilometer or two um, for a few weeks before you go up a mountain, that's fine. But you don't want to be too vigorous. If you want to be vigorous, then if you're going in six months to a big mountain, then start now. No. It, start now. But you cannot start now and go for two weeks and then go to a very taxing mountain. Actually, it's, it will not be good for your body. Mm. Um, Cost-wise, people should not feel limited because you can just start with some free hills you go up to. You can go to Kilimaja uh, Bogo, which you only pay a little bit uh, longer not. Mm. is also accessible. We have Lukenya down here. It's accessible if you're from Nairobi. But if you're thinking about going big, going to Mount Kenya, going to Kilimanjaro, Ruwenzori, for now, I'd say Mount Kenya is the cheapest, um, followed by Ruwenzori. Mm -hmm. But Ruwenzori takes longer. And then Kilimanjaro, you can also do it, but it's more expensive. So it's not cheap. Um, for gear, that's where, again, it becomes very costly. But these days, there's a lot of gear available for rent. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go out and buy 300,000 worth of gear mm -hmm. to go up a mountain and you never use it again. You can just come like to my office and rent that and okay. then go up and down. Um, yeah, and the, the more people you are in a group, the cheaper it is. Mm -hmm. You can start by one day climb, then go to a two day and three and then build up that way and then if you find that you like mountaineering then you can buy your own gear and start yeah. doing something bigger what determines how many days you take going up a summit it, what determines is uh which summit you're going to so if you're going to mount kenya and you're going to point Lanana, some people go for two days there are three days four days i would determine that by when somebody comes to me and say hey i want to go to to Lanana. i'll ask a lot of questions uh, your physical fitness, where you live, what you eat, do you have any ailments, like diseases that mm. you have? It, not that I'll tell you you can't go, mm. but it will help me decide which way. A lot of people who have those issues will take them for four days, and I know which route is easier mm. for them. Um, somebody will say, oh, you know, I want to go to Mount Kenya, but I want to have fun. Then I'll say four days, and I'll take you fishing also. 
as we go up, right. you know, bring in other things, not just <laughs> the mountain. How long would you climb Mount Kenya in? Me? Yes. I can go up and down in a day. In a day. Yeah. And so uh, maybe a, a bit of a funner question. Mm -hmm. You talked about being in a rope team. So I'm trying to imagine climbing up the mountain and somebody needs to stop. Bathroom break. So when somebody needs to stop, everybody then needs to stop. Yes. Do you wait? Or then you wait for somebody <laughs> to get <laughs> over <laughs> your thing and then you oh, continue. Oh, is there a timetable? Yeah. It's like, bathroom hey, guy, break, bathroom break 30 seconds. <laughs> kind of there are two types of ropes. <laughs> uh -huh. If you're doing technical climbing like on Mount Kenya and you're climbing up to Batian, um, one person goes up mm. head of the rope and then the other one follows and then you, you stop there mm. so you can read yourself when you're there because you, you can be clipped in or the other person has left you can read yourself after they leave but when you are glacier traveling like let's say on um, on Ruenzori if you have to do glacier uh, or Denali or Aconcagua um, you are tied in and you stay tied in until you summit and come back down. Explain, so, explain tied in. So I have a rope and I'm the leader. Then in about 30 feet, you're there. Not another 30 feet, you're there and you're last. And I'm the one going and you have to follow those steps. And the reason why you're tied in is because of the huge crevices that you can fall in. So if you fall and you're behind me, mm. I have, I'm ready. So I go at a, what we call it an arrest. You arrest, you arrest, and then you stay suspended in the hole. And then she is the one who figures a way of getting to you. Mm. And all together, we get you out. Because you go out ready mm. for those rescue. Wow. Yeah. So you say you remain tied in. So what does that mean? You're wearing a diaper? What happens? No, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> you're wearing a harness. It's like a diaper. You're wearing a harness, <laughs> and uh, it, it, unfortunately, there are different types of harness. There are some that come specifically for women, so if they sh they have to relieve themselves, mm. they can just untie it in a way that half is still tied. For men, it's it's much easier. Mm -hmm. And so, what I'm saying is, if you are <laughs> going and you have to relieve yourself, we are facing that way. Yeah. So we stop, and we are facing that way, and you do your business. And I let's move. You. But what yep. do you attach this equipment to? Because there's you at the front. Mm -hmm. If someone falls, yeah. there's a likelihood of this person dragging everybody. Yeah. So what other security do you have? When you go out there, I would not go there with greenhorns. I would go with somebody I've trained, somebody who I know that will react in the right way. It's not an easy training. It will take you like three or four weeks if you're going to do an expedition like that. So that I know that when I fall, I'm safe with you. When you fall, you're safe with me and we prove to one another like that. And it happens. When you are a teacher. Mm. Mm. Essentially what you're saying is mountain climbing has many facets to it, but at some point it gets technical. Yes. How many schools are there in Kenya where people can be trained in mountain climbing? Mm -hmm. And what is it that these training schools hope to achieve uh, unfortunately that is one place that we need to still address with the government mm. we used to have outward bound mm. which um, is still there but it has moved away from what it was now i think it's foreign owned or something like that so you have really no control on that but you, if you have money you can still pay to go there um, but they are way of training is different there's Kesa, which is owned by the government mm -hmm. but usually it's exclusive for for the, the rangers for the army and all that so we really don't have a real school that i can go train here in kenya i train people like i train rangers on Renzori, i train people on tanzania i work for a school on contract called north mm -hmm. which used to be here for many years um, right now, I'm currently, I'm the most senior instructor all over the world for mm -hmm. them. So I'll go where they are. They'll ask me to go. Mm -hmm. And um, we, so if we need to train people here in Kenya, I would incorporate them and bring them here and they certify us. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive, but sometimes they sponsor mm -hmm. people to do that. So when I train people myself mm -hmm. is I'll bring up people slowly over years. And then when I feel they are ready, I'll take them to U.S., and under this school, right. and they can come back with a certificate. Hmm. Let's now talk about this conquest uh, up Mount Everest. In a team of, it's an all-black team, you wanted to make history, you made history. How did this story begin? 
It began, began a long time when we went to Denali. Some of us thought about it, but we never talked about it. In 2013? Yes. Mm -hmm. Before 2013, personally, um, when I became the first uh, black African to summit Denali in 1989, then 1994, I was the first one on a Konkakwa, which is about 23,000 feet. That's the second highest peak in the world. Aconcagua, no, that is the highest, the highest in the Southern it? Hemisphere. Mm. Wow. It's in Argentina, mm -hmm. and it's the highest in Southern America. And in 1991, I represent Africa on a cl peace climb in Europe. And going through all those and climbing different mountains, climbing a lot in Patagonia, in Chile, I decided, oh, why can't I be the first uh, uh, black person on, black African on Everest? And it was in my line, I was, I really wanted to do it. I looked for sponsors, actually twice got in a group that was going, but then the sponsors could only sponsor people who are residents of America. So mm. I got kicked out uh, and both times all of them submitted. So in 2000 and no, 1996, South America, South Africa came up with uh, an expedition that was exclusive uh, South African. They went up, but unfortunately that was the time that we lost a lot of people on Everest, mm. and so they had to turn around. And in 2003, they sponsored a person from Lesotho, and he summited. Mm -hmm. So he was the first black person in 2003. So when I heard that, I was like, oh, okay. Uh, my goal is point. gone. Yeah. So I started questioning myself. Why um, do I do mountaineering? And I realized that I love the teaching and I love teaching how people how to be safe on mountains. And that satisfied me so much. Mm. I loved taking kids and taking them out and showing them how to take care of themselves, how to be dependent. Mm -hmm. And seeing that growth, that to me was that perfect. So at that point, I was like, you know. I really don't need to go to Everest to do this. There's a lot more I'm doing out here. Mm -hmm. True, Everest is so expensive. You know, it's like 10 million to go up there. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I just gave up. So in 2013, when I met all these people, one of them in particular, a friend of mine called Phil Hederson, who was the leader of this expedition, also thought about the first black team on Everest. And why the first black team on Everest? Everest has been claimed by over 4,000 people. Mm. But out of those, only eight were black over all those years. And he wanted to do something to show that people, not only blacks, but people of color can also do those things. Mm. And so he started thinking about it. He never told me after that. And then two years ago, he calls me and says, KG, we are going to Everest. I say, when? Next year. <laughs> okay, I'm not done. I'm, yeah. I'm not going. Um, I've decided I'm not going. Yeah. I say, why? I'm too old. My knees are just, you know, the doctors have decided I should have knee replacement. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done it yet. And so I went, on. what else? Um, mm -hmm. I cannot spend all that time without earning anything. Mm. You know, it's, you know. And he said, no, we can talk about those things. So he talked about me. He talked about why he is asking me. Um, he really needed me on the expedition um, because he knows I'm very supportive. I'm very motivating to groups. Mm -hmm. And I bring up good vibe mm -hmm. in, a, in an expedition. And eventually I said, okay, I'll go. So I got in as the only Kenyan. And I was behind them because they were able Coming from US, they were able to go out and do expeditions by themselves, no one another. Luckily enough, I had knew like four of them uh -huh. I had gone up mountains mm -hmm. with. So that did not bother me. In January, uh, we went to Nepal for a hike for 20 days. And it, so we did some team building. I specialize in that. So I brought it up two days of team building. And then, yeah, we are ready for the mountain. Mm -hmm. So that's how I. That whole him. process, how long did it take? Planning, training, especially training, yes. and then climbing the mountain and coming down. It, I would say it's two years, especially for the people in the U.S. Mm. <laughs> and for them, most of them are athletes mm -hmm. um, sponsored by North Face. So they are used to doing shorter trips. But me, I'm used to doing long trips, like expeditions. Yeah. Mm. And for me, I did not do the... I did not need to do the... 
extreme training mm. they were doing to get ready. Right. Just because my mm. job is taking me out from June, I was in the field in all US the time. all the way to December. So mm. um, on snow, doing these things. And then when I came back, um, I had to do in training here on Mount Kenya, mm. on Ruenzori's when I was around. And that was my main challenge, mm. um, that it, we had sponsors from there to go, but I did not have sponsors for other things. Mm. I approached the government, I approached so many companies, I was let down and I almost gave up. Mm. And then when we came back from the poll, that's when I met Betika mm -hmm. and they said, look, what are your challenges? Mm -hmm. Said. I am not earning from June all the way, from December all the way to June. Mm. So I need to pay tickets to Nepal. Mm. I need uh, training money on Mount Kenya. I need to go to Renzori's. I need this. And they said, okay, we'll take care of that. Mm. And when you come back, we'll take care of you going out and preaching the gospel to other people to become mountaineers. So Betika came in at the right time. Oh, Indeed. lovely. Kicked in mm. and helped me a lot. And they are still supporting me. So Betika has been with you now through that journey of preparation, going there, and also now yes. as you come back and you're talking about it's, da it's doable, yes. it's workable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And encouraging everybody, anybody who is listening to you this morning and hearing, you know, I'd like to climb a mountain, yep. the conversation that you're giving us this morning, all this is courtesy of Betika. Yes, it is courtesy of Betika, but it was also one of my requests I did that I'm doing this to preach this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people need to go out to the mountains and not necessarily mountains. They can go for a walk. We need to do it for our own physical fitness. Sure. And I don't need to tell people what you gain from it. I just want you to try mm. and then come back and tell me how you how feel. You feel. Um, uh, yeah, just encourage people to go to the outdoors. The other thing that I would like to do is I'm doing more presentations today. I'm doing a presentation at the Museum of Kenya. And one of the things we have in Kenya is mountaineering is not considered as a sport. Well, so whenever you go out to ask for money for support, you're told, this oh, no this one is not there. <laughs> and like when I did represented Africa in Europe, I sold everything I had to pay to for To be my able to go. Yes. To equipment, uh, tickets and all that. And, and yet back. you're training your body and your mind in a yes. way just any other sportsman, if not more, yes. would do. Yeah. How long did it take you from, let's say, at the foot of the mountain to the summit and back? Now we're talking about Everest. Everest. How, how long did that, did that take? Foot of the mountain, I guess you'd, uh, you're asking about Everest Base Camp, but mm -hmm. it takes so much to get there mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. you know, it took us like 18 days to get there. And uh, fortunately, is, uh, you know, you said photos and people ask, are you in town? <laughs> it's not like being on Mount Kenya. When you go to Mount Kenya at 14,000, on Everest, 14,000 people are growing potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> 17,000 people are growing potatoes. People are living there. Mm. People have hotels. So you go People from dressed in t-shirts. Yeah, you're going <laughs> from one town to the other. <laughs> and still, you know, those small trails you're like climbing big, Everest. you're looking down, you mm. can fall in the time. And a cow or a yak just comes by and you boom. <laughs> like it's used. And those mm. shoppers the same. Mm. And then when you go there, you have to spend like five days acclimatizing at seventeen thousand. Mm -hmm. And you start doing these hikes and then you start rotations. You go to camp one, camp two, camp three. You come back and then you start again. Mm. The most dangerous part is from Everest Base Camp to Camp One. That's where the Kumbu Ice Fall is, mm. which uh, has a lot of ice that sometimes can collapse. Mm. Um, like this year, I think that only deaths we had occurred there. Mm. I think four of them, if mm. I'm not wrong, one Russian and three Nepalese. Mm. Um, up above there, it's not as bad, but it's very, very steep. So it took us one, uh, from the base, it definitely took us at least 20 days, including the times you are acclimatizing mm -hmm. to go up and down. And we were lucky because mm -hmm. we got an early window and summited on 12th May. Oh. Um, some people are waiting for 28th. And right now the weather is just too hot. Mm, it's hot. Yeah. Getting into monsoon season. Wow. Yeah. You know, KG, there's a lot that you've taught us this morning. Right. And there's there are many people who are listening to the conversation and just seeing the comments on social media, many are feeling inspired. Just the way you speak, the way you have such great passion for all the work that you've done. 
And I think we just want to say, you know, on behalf of everybody in the country, mm. thank you for representing us up there and mm. congratulations for all the work that you've done. Yeah, and and keep doing it. I mean, 62. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> young. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're, you're still young. And if your knees could, despite the doctor's warnings, if your yeah. knees could actually go to the highest point on, on earth. Yeah. I see. Oh, knees yeah. are fine. Why can't I, I your can knee just walk around Kenya? Your knees are fine. <laughs> I, I, I can. I, I, I'm not going to do it for a while. Uh -huh. Yeah. I just wish the government would recognize this. Yes. So far, I haven't had anything. And I'm content. Wait, but what? For, yeah. Mm. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm content, but... Um, when it goes to the government, I feel like then it touches more people. Yeah. Mm. You know, people see the seriousness. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. I think that's the message that's going to the government. Mm -hmm. The president himself, yeah. particularly, he ought to hear this. Yeah. He ought to actually have sent out that recognition. Like, yes, mm -hmm. I wish to congratulate um, KG for doing this. Asante Sana for joining us, KG. Incredible. And you. come again soon. I'm sure the next time we'll ask people to call in and ask you very many questions. There are people who are budding mountaineers. Mm. They'd like to know one or two things. Okay.